Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks for your, your efforts in uh, getting, sometimes these Zoom meetings don't make uh, a lot of sense when we're trying to figure it out, especially if we haven't had a lot of experience with it, it could be somewhat daunting. So thanks for the efforts that you put into doing that, uh, Vicki and everyone there. I think just working together, it makes a difference. Um, I'm gonna ask you to do one other thing now too, and that is um, I, I, if you could make me the, the host uh, and while you guys figure that out on that end, um, I just want to share, I'll share a couple things because oh, I see. without being a host, I can't share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay, while you guys are figuring that out, okay, I'm the host now, great. Uh, still, I wanted to um, just reflect for a moment. First, thank you all for, for being present. I see a strong online presence this, this, this morning, and it's just wonderful. I want to reflect on it for a moment. The, the practice of Zazen as I was originally taught it was done, and I, you know, we can take this for granted now, but it was done in the same place at the same time. And by place, I mean proximity, because even though we are, we are far away from each other, as far as distance goes, still in a sense, we're in the same place. You think about it. We're in the same. We're we're synchronized in terms of time and place, but in terms of place, and actually also in terms of time, because there may be a little lag between when I'm speaking and when you actually hear it. More so because it's through a computer. So there is there is this this, this very subtle distinction I want to make that's happening now in the, in within the past four or five years where you could actually study and practice in real time in the same place. And by that, I mean the big place, but it's different from the way that I had originally learned it. And that is being close in close proximity to my teacher physically like within two feet. And there's something for me, for me, that was absolutely essential. I realize not everybody's going to learn in that way, but for me, especially, it was so essential to uh, be next to my teacher because the instructions she gave verbally while they were good, seeing her practice was absolutely essential to witness her sitting still and, and to see her facial expressions. It was absolutely, absolutely so important. Now today, thanks to Zoom, I'm realizing we can, we can practice at least Zazen in, uh, without being, having such close proximity. And that opens the door opens the doors for a lot of people who would other, otherwise may feel, for whatever reason, uh, may not be able to come closer together, right? It just opens the door a lot wider and it, it, it changes things a little bit. And it makes me wonder if, if not having had that physical close proximity experience, um, you're possibly experiencing this differently. Certainly we're ex all experiencing this differently. And, and what I have experienced as in terms of Zazen uh, may not be what you have experienced, even if we were in the same like close proximity space, the experiences of each of us may not be the same. But I know from my own personal experience, when I'm sitting in a, in a space with others who are also practicing in close proximity under the same roof, there's an energetic change there. And I can kind of feel that when we're doing this online, I can kind of feel it online. Um, so anyways, it's just, I'm just reflecting on this. This is, this is a, I just wanna reflect on the fact that this is a real shift from the way that I understand practice as well as centuries of practice, really. 
Uh, and I don't know where that's going. You know, I don't know if it's bad or good, but I just notice it's a real, it's a real change, a real shift. And in some cases, it might work out better. In other cases, may not. And I just have a big question mark on it. So I'm just, I just want to bring it up. It's something that I, that comes to my mind. So let me share my screen with you. Let's see. Hey. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. I, I, I want to come to a point with that. But let me. Um, so this is this is the the title of this talk is seeing through the troubles of life. How might how might Zazen help us? And I'm going to leave that as a big question mark. Again, it's I, I don't have an answer to that, but this is a this is a particular calligraphy hopefully you all can see that online there uh one of the calligraphies i've been practicing over the past year it says clouds go blue mountain appears cloud goes blue mountain appears so i'd like to offer four possible interpretations of this purely zen sin cloud or clouds go, blue mountain appears. So maybe just to take it in a few different, you know, four different layers, starting with maybe the the topmost layer and and going uh, a little almost oh, misspelling here. Apologies for that. So um, we could uh, most of these Zen sayings, or if not all of them, have some metaphor for zazen. The image of the the mountains and the clouds. Uh, I could give a talk that is completely rational based, and certainly aspects of what I'm going to share and that I've shared already are rationally based. However, there are loads of images that could aid me in and aid us in understanding our practice. In, images are, or symbols in, invoke something in our minds and in our hearts that may help us to understand Zen practice and Zazen in ways that, that rational thought about it may not. So I want to offer four different ways to, to think about this saying about the clouds and the mountains. So maybe the most surface level would be that the clouds, clouds are a symbol for thoughts in the mind. And there is often the, um, an image invoked by teachers to think of your thoughts as clouds floating by so that we gain a little bit different perspective on whatever is happens uh, you know is happening to us in our lives or in our in our mental world but of course that's a what's happening in our mental world is always a mirror of what's happening in our in our world or in our external environment and I'm no different from anybody else in terms of the difficulties and the troubles that life sends sends me. And so this is this is something this is a way to kind of conceptualize what is happening. Sometimes when we feel we've got some we've got something some difficulty. So one way one way to think about these challenges that come our way and and they will show up in our zen practice as a multitude of thoughts that may be recurring that may be very difficult to look at or or see or think about and we want to it's almost like we want to get rid of them or you know and and so the first level is thinking about these thoughts like clouds in the sky and when we do that we put a little bit of distance between 
ourselves and our thoughts. We put a little bit of space. Sometimes we, we are fooled by our thoughts. Sometimes we are, we are fooled or deceived like Darth Vader tells Luke Skywalker, right? Your thoughts deceive you, young Skywalker. <laughs> I just enjoy that metaphor, but uh, we, get, we, get, we get fooled by our thoughts and we confuse our thoughts with ourself. Uh, you know, we all do it, we all do it. And so this particular instruction can be very, very helpful for anybody to get a larger perspective on, on thoughts and on thinking. And we could just try that right now as we're, as we're sitting, as we're listening, maybe just take a moment, 10 seconds of silence and just see if you can see the thoughts in your mind as like clouds in the sky coming and going. Now, when I do that, I, I notice an internal shift and the center of gravity shifts from my head to my abdomen. Now, that's just what I'm noticing personally. You might have a different experience with that, but I just want to offer you a way to, you know, through my own example, something that might be helpful for you. May, may be helpful, maybe not. Another way to, uh, and the other, uh, the other aspect is that, is that the mountain itself is, is real. So there's things in our life that are not real, and there's things in our life that are, are real. Might be a way to think about our life. And the mountain could be possibly a symbol for enlightenment, once the clouds dissipate, then the mountain appears. In the same way, once the thoughts dissipate, then we see clearly what's in front of us or what we need to do, or maybe we have some insight about our life. I think it's important to recognize that, like I said last week, you don't have to be a monk and go into a temple to attain enlightenment. Our very life itself, our daily life, the challenges that our daily life brings us, even if they have nothing and nothing at all to do with Buddhism or anything like that. That's what Buddhism is talking about. Enlightenment is not separate from, from our daily life. And that includes our relationships with our loved ones, with our partners, with our children, with our parents with our bosses you know they, they don't, we don't have to wait for everybody to be um missionized and become buddhist for us to get this buddhism is talking about our life as it is not a pretend life in the future but this very life and everything in your life right now is a field for enlightenment Everything in your life right now is where the temple is at. It's not some special location, right? So we have this opportunity. We have this opportunity when we're doing Zazen to see life, our life in this way. Not some kind of idea about enlightenment, but our life as it is. We can see our life as it is. And... Uh, let, let's just, um, you know, so maybe just take that in for a sec. So this is the first way, or maybe one way, that may be helpful for us to understand this saying, clouds go, blue mountain appears. Now, another way would be to see that the clouds, the clouds are, kind of a symbol of fluidity. There, there's a sense of flowing. There's a Zen saying also, go like the clouds, run like water. So to not be 
to not be attached to your personal views. And this can also help us in regards to those things I mentioned, regard, regards to relationship in particular, that we have our views of what we think is right or wrong, and then the person that we're with has their own views of what's right and wrong. And we could have a fight about that, or we could flow with it. We could, you know, we could disagree with the other person respectfully, or we could get a, you know, there's a lot of options there. But in how, whatever option we choose, it's also possible to relinquish our personal preferences and to uh, simply go with the situation without dis necessarily agreeing nor disagreeing. Because again, there's something underneath the conversation, the verbal conversation that is realer or deeper than whatever is being said with the tongue. There's something more there. That's what we might refer to as the mountain here. And so this, again, this image of the clouds as being symbols of fluidity that can help us not get stuck or too attached to our own ideas. Maybe a, a, another way to see this. Uh, I want to, and, and part of this too is that the clouds are not our enemy in this view. In this view, the clouds are not necessarily necessarily the enemy and the mountain our friend, but um, we talk about in Zen that delusion and, and enlightenment, delusion and enlightenment are not two separate things. In the way of the world, there is enlightenment, which is separate from delusion. If you're deluded, you're not enlightened. That's how that works. There's this dualistic way of seeing enlightenment and delusion. But from, the, from another standpoint, enlightenment and delusion are inseparable. They're inseparable. You can't have enlightenment without delusion. In a sense, the mountain doesn't exist without the clouds. The clouds don't exist without the mountain. The mountain is sometimes visible, it's sometimes invisible, but it's always present. It's always there, whether we can see it or not. Again, I'm not talking about some abstract idea of enlightenment. I'm talking about our very life, your very life. Whatever is true and meaningful for you is present. It may be obscured sometimes, but your internal compass of what you need to do and where you need to go is always, always there. Sometimes it's obscured. So here's a third, here's the third, um, perhaps a third way of thinking about this. And these things may bleed one into the other, but, and there may be some overlap here, but do the clouds obscuring enlightenment ever depart completely? In other words, is it vain to think that the clouds are going to be completely disappeared and eventually the mountain or enlightenment will appear? Is it vain to, to think in that way? I, I think that's a, like we're waiting for the blue sky in a sense. Sometimes we're, we find ourselves waiting in anticipation of a blue sky so that we can see far, far away. And, and I'm sure most, if not all of you have been in situations where you've seen like the, clair you know, the, 
maybe it's it's a view a vista that you stopped on the road and there was a clear sky and you could see far far like miles ahead or maybe it was in the middle of the night and you were in a place that didn't have a lot of light pollution and you could see the millions of stars in the sky up ahead there was no ob obscuration by the clouds or by light right we've all had i think we've all had experiences like that too but is it necessary that the clouds have to be completely gone in order for us to get a deeper or a clearer view and sometimes it feels like maybe here's a metaphor i'll introduce here it feels like sometimes what we're trying to do when we're practicing zazen is it's like a human on the earth looking for the clouds to disappear by using their own breath to blow on them to get them to move right you can see how futile that effort would be if you were a human being you know you see the clouds up in the sky and you try to blow on them to get them to move they're they're not going to obey but yet sometimes what we do in zazen is we think oh okay if i just if i concentrate hard enough then these thoughts will get out of my mind but if the thoughts are really like clouds they may have their own energy behind them so waiting for the clouds may not be the best strategy do the clouds have to depart completely now just the question and this is also an opportunity for us to develop one of the perfections and that is patience right so when we find ourselves in a space in a headspace in a in a in a uh, mental spin or a mental rut that's just not going anywhere you could employ effort towards patience. So putting some effort into the practice of patience. Patience isn't something that we either have or have not. Rather, it's a practice that we can develop. We can develop patience in our practice, in our zazen. So one of the ways my teacher taught about this is, um, I'm going to stop the share for a second. She taught a, a teaching called sit to your limit plus one minute. So for some people, it might be really hard. Even this sitting that we did this, this, uh, this morning, 30 minutes might be a challenge. And if it's not a challenge for us now, it might be a challenge for us sometime in the future when we have a million things going on in our lives and we just feel like it's not possible to sit even a few minutes. So one of the teachings my teacher offered as a patience practice, right? The practice of patience. It's not that sometimes people, we get told I'm patient or I'm not patient. You may have gotten a message as a, a younger person that you're a patient person or you're a not a patient person. And that's not really helpful for, for practice because it, it uh, confuses our identity with a mental state as opposed to decoupling our, uh, our identity from a mental state. I think this is where we get, we get in trouble with all these mental states as we've coupled, we've fused together thoughts and identity. And so if our thoughts are you know, anger, uh, jealousy, et cetera, we, think, we identify as those, as those thoughts. And if we've gotten the message as kids that, oh, I'm patient, I'm generous, I'm loving, I'm kind, then we also identify ourselves with those kinds of thoughts. And really what practice is doing, what Zazen is doing is decoupling the identification with thoughts. And, that, and so with regards to patience, with regards to being patient, this isn't something we either are or aren't. This is something we have to put effort into. 
And just like you don't, you're, we're not born learning, knowing how to play the piano, we, we, we have to practice playing the piano. Even if you become like, a, a, you know, an expert pian pianist, you still have to practice. You still have to practice. And the same thing with patience. We have to practice it. And so my teacher would say, sit to your limit plus one minute. And this is especially helpful if you're sitting, it, it might be easier to do if you're sitting on your, on your own, or for those of you sitting online, it might be easier for you to do because you don't feel the same self-consciousness when you're sitting in a group. That's maybe one of the benefits to um, being online. Uh, but I would suggest that you could do this even when you're in a group too. And if you need to do it, then you, you know, certainly should. And that is, once you've hit your limit, and how, what's your limit? Well, you've got to listen to your own body. When, when, uh, when we're sitting for a certain mere period of time, your body's going to do strange things that you might feel very uncomfortable with. It might warm up. It might get cold. Uh, you might tighten up in, in certain spots. Your heart or your chest area might clench. You might get a feeling of spaciousness, right? So we want to be able to identify when we're at our limitation, when, our, when we're physically at our limits. Anybody who has done any kind of physical exercise for a prolonged period of time of training has to be able to identify their limitations. If you're a runner, you've got to know how to pace yourself if you're going a long distance run. Right? Same thing as a swimmer, I had to know how to pace myself if I was going to make survive a two hour or a three hour practice. You can't just like go full speed ahead for the first five minutes and then call it a day if you want to do a three hour practice. And the same thing goes with Zazen, how we sit is really important. So if we're expecting immediate results, then maybe this is where we can begin to develop patience and, and learn to sit in a way that, that allows for whatever it is that we're experiencing to, exper to experience that. Sit to your limit plus one minute means that when you've hit your limit, whatever, it, and we can, you know, it may be helpful to have a conversation with, with, with myself or somebody that you trust on where your limit is with practice. Now, sometimes it's helpful to talk about it and then you can identify it more clearly. Where's the, where's the limit? These limits change. The, the limit is, is not fixed. Anyway, sitting to your limit. When you feel like your, your legs are saying no more. I mean, even now, as you're sitting watching this, you might be like, all right, I'm at my limit. <laughs> I'm ready to quit. Uh, I'm ready for a change. Um, what do you do with that moment? Well, there, there's an opportunity to practice patience, develop patience. And that might look like Deliberately softening your body, wherever it might be tight, the muscles to deliberately mentally kind of rest and soften. It might be that, okay, I'm, I need to lay down right now. I can still listen to this, but I'm going to lay down. I'll lay on my back flat. It might look like I need to stand up or walk. These are the four postures, right? Sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. These are the four postures in which we can practice. So we have to keep in mind and, and keep flexible, keep our, our minds flexible. And nobody's going to judge us for doing that, right? It's easier to see this when you're on Zoom and you can possibly turn your camera off and then you don't feel self-conscious about it. But even in together, I remember when I was sitting at Tassajara, I had a really bad back pain. And, and I, I just asked the teacher, you know, I, my, I can't sit up without this stabbing pain in my back. So, so the teacher said, okay, well, why don't you lie down? And um, they had me lie down in front of the, the uh, abbess of, the, of Tassajara at that time. 
<laughs> but I didn't, you know what? I didn't give it. I didn't give, I didn't give it, you know what, about it because I was in so much pain. I just said, okay, I don't care. She could watch me. <laughs> so we got to develop also some thick skin around it. You know, we need to develop some thick skin around our self consciousness. A lot of us um, may feel self conscious about our practice. And, um, when I first started practicing, there was really you either, you know, if you were really self-conscious about it, then you just wouldn't practice with a group. You just practice on your own. And uh, in a sense, you can still do that uh, e more easily now. You can do it with a group, but online. So it makes it a little bit easier to do that too. But there's also some benefit to developing thick skin and not worrying about what other people think about us. This is I think this is really important. This is a central teaching of Zen, and that is to not be pulled by praise and blame. Because again, we identify, we've, we've come to identify or hold an identity around uh, when people praise us, we think we're good. And we think that, that, goodness, that goodness then becomes our identity. Or when people, uh, ridicule us or blame us in some way, then we identify ourselves as bad or blameworthy. Both of these are, are really problematic mentally because we are way more than these identity identities. We're way more than that. And if we begin to invest some effort into the practice for the sake of the practice, not worrying about praise and blame, not worrying about praise not doing things to look for, oh, he's going to say something good about my practice or, or out of fear that you're going to be told something that you shouldn't, that you don't wanna hear. Of course, there's that too. And, and we get affected by what people say. I get affected when people praise me or blame me. I feel you know there might be tightening and all that, but that's why I practice. That's why I practice so that I can dislodge myself from that idea those identities and not hold on to them too tightly. So I'm just saying, you know, people, we all feel certain ways when we, when we sit, when we do practice, we've, we've become identified with certain, um, certain qualities. We think we're patient. We think we're kind. And I, I sometimes I joke and say, I, I didn't realize how nasty of a person was until I started training with my teacher. <laughs> It's not that I'm a, you know, that's the other extreme, you, you know, you flop back and forth. But how do we deal with, with praise or the lack of praise when we're looking for it? Not that we don't, we shouldn't give out praise, but sometimes that praise can actually, I was just listening to a podcast on this, that where praise, there's been all kinds of studies on this, where praise of one's intellect could actually be detrimental to performance. And that, I would apply that to Zazen or Zen practice in general, that when you get praise, not too much praise, but praise specifically of your intellect or of your identity, where, where, you, where the praise is fused with identity, then it actually uh, reduces our ability to per perform well in whatever task we're doing. Um, but what the what the person uh, who is uh, sharing this this uh, the, this information was saying that, but if one's effort one's effort at an activity is praised, then performance increases. One's ability to uh, to do better and better at a task improves. There's a, and this reminded me of a uh, of a teacher, one of one of my uh, a teaching that my teacher gave, and that is that to be very careful about telling somebody that they're doing that they they are good at something, rather to look at the efforts and you you might rephrase that as it's getting better right you're do, i can see that you're doing as long as that that's actually what you're seeing if you see some degree of improvement 
right? To, to just to say, instead of praising the person as being good, you could say, you're getting better at this. You're getting better at this activity. If you're in that, when you're in that role, and we're all in that role at times, at some times. Right? And we can also say that to ourselves. You know, the only one of the reasons why I do, I keep at calligraphy is because I know I can do better. I, you know, I see the calligraphy I do, and I, it's, and I, it's not that I think it's bad or good, but I know, you know, what if I did this little thing a little bit different, a little bit different, and to have that sense of, of, uh, you know, that that kind of self-talk can be helpful for for improving our performance and not getting caught up in praise and blame. I think this is a big problem for us humans in general. We get so caught up and we want people to think goodly, highly of us. We want, we're afraid of not um, uh, having that. Okay, so let me get back to this slideshow. Ah, all right. So here's another fourth way to look at this, um, this particular Zen saying, to ask this question, is it a problem? Is it a problem to see that the mountains are obscured by the clouds? Right? Is that a problem? Can we, can we accept the narrowness of our vision? Can we accept that our vision, our views are by definition limited and incomplete? One of the, 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 the first rungs on the Eightfold Path is right view. And right view is the view that's not caught in any one particular view or perspective. Dogen says this in a number of different ways, and I'm just thinking of two examples he gives. One is at the beginning of uh, Fukan Zazengi, where he says something like, um, Suppose you are endowed with enlightenment and uh, have raised an aspiration that touches the sky. You are still playing at the entrance way and have not entered the path of total emancipation, right? So we might, and some, some people may be really puffed up and think they're really good at this and they know what they're doing and they've been doing it for a long time. And Dogen is saying, be careful, be careful of that kind of thinking about, so, you know, especially if you've been doing this for a long time, you might think, oh, I got it. I know it. I know what I'm doing. Right. I've been, I've done a number of sessions. I'm good. Right? So be careful. That, and uh, one of the other images Dogen uses is uh, to, to express the narrowness of our views. He says it's like when we, we look through a bamboo hole at one corner of the sky and confuse what we see in through that bamboo pole as the entire sky, right? So, you know, think, imagine a telescope. Now, in those days, maybe they used the bamboo pole, but a telescope gives you a, you know, it can see very deeply, but it only sees one tiny little segment of the entire sky. And, and that's kind of a metaphor for our views. They're really, really narrow. They're really narrow. Even if it's a broad view, it's a narrow view. Um, and we need, here's where Sangha, where community is so vital. We need the perspectives of others. I can share just, just this morning, um, you know, I, I recognized there's some limit. Is this a, uh, an issue in my own life right now? going on, and I'm just sharing it as an example, not that I need, um, you know, I, I need something from you guys, but the, in one issue, this issue that I'm having, I'm dealing with, I recognize that I am not getting the full picture, and I need, I need some other uh, perspectives on this, and then I had a conversation about it with my partner, and, and there was, you know, there's another view, that helps to round out the the picture a little bit more. I still don't have the I don't have the big view. It's like those mountains are really obscured by the clouds. I don't have the big view. But this is where communication and conversation with others 
can help to fill out the views, right? There's many, and this is where it's so vital that when, if you think that your view is not important, consider, reconsider that, reconsider that idea that your view is unimportant. We need everybody's views to get the fuller picture of what we're seeing. It's not just no, no matter how intelligent we are, no matter how much we've practiced, no, how, no matter how much we've studied, we still need to hear other points of view because that, the, they are going to round out or help us to understand more deeply the smallness of our views and the greatness of the universe. This is Sangha. So um, another instance, I, uh, you saw these images of uh, Ragbri at the start. The, the uh, Register's annual great bike across Iowa. And it starts from, um, it starts from, um, here's an image, let, let, me, uh, let me stop there a second. Uh, it started, the, this, this race, start, it's not a race, it's a bike ride. And it starts from the Western border of Iowa and goes to the Eastern border, it's done one, it's on all on bicycle. And um, I've known about it since I came to Iowa in 2014. And this year I got to actually participate in it on uh, Wednesday. It just worked, matched up perfectly with my schedule. I didn't even have to change anything about my schedule. And it, the, the, the ride was coming right through the city of Ames and going down to Des Moines. So it couldn't have been more convenient for me to hop on my bicycle. So I, I, um, registered for the event. So I was doing it legally because there's a lot of folks who uh, didn't do it legally. They just started on. But, but anyways, you, um, it's, and it was just a magical, magical experience to join. At one point I heard there was 100,000 bikers and you just enter this stream of, of bikers and all of a sudden you're on the road and you're, dry, you're riding past cornfields that maybe you were in in your car passing by, but now it's you're in open air and there's this sound of cycles. There's something special about the sound of pedaling, right? When you hear those feet pedaling and the sound and the, the sound of the chain on the bike. And then all of these people, you're you're surrounded by hundreds of people in front of you and behind you. If you, you know, there's always people passing you. Sometimes you're passing others and there's and there was these stops along the way between Ames and Des Moines. So I just did one little leg. It was about 55 miles and I've never, never ridden that far before. So I was very um, nervous about it, but also super excited because it was just like pick up and go and do it. And luckily I was able to have my uh, mother-in-law was able to give me a ride back from Des Moines. She was excited uh, and very supportive of that whole thing. And really the whole state, is very supportive of all the bikers. Everywhere we went, there was lot, loads of support. And you have people coming, I met people from California, Los Angeles, uh, Oregon. Um, there were people in other countries as well. And uh, so let me show you, we had, when the, the, the bikers came through Ames, where I live, um, this, uh, this one group of three bikers that were kind of in, in a group together, uh, asked to stay in our backyard if they could camp out in our backyard. And so we, yeah, we said, yeah, you could, you could do that. And we learned from them that they had been biking all the way from uh, the state of Oregon. They started in June and they had biked from the state of Oregon. They were going through, uh, they were joining up with Ragbri illegally. And then um, and then at the end of Ragby, they were going to continue up to the state of Maine. So they're still riding right now. Um, and that's what, so this image I wanted to share is uh, those those three. So this was the this was the this was the morning of the the bike ride that I started. And uh, see these these three folks here were were all riding together. And um, so it was just so inspirational to see them them doing this and so I, again i was super excited this was the the start for me in the city of ames this is right near if those of you who know ames this is the um 
the but where the butterfly garden is. It's right next to Iowa. It's right through Iowa State University. So that was the start of it. And um, and then here is uh, my writing partner was Kate Kennedy. And here we are about probably about a little bit more than halfway through the ride. And this was in Ankeny. Maybe some of you know, know Ankeny. You can see the um, water tower behind us. So there's an Ankeny on it. And it's a, it's a, it's a uh, small city between Ames and, and Des Moines where um, DMACC, uh, Des Moines Area Community College is. So we, um, we stopped there. And you know, I I, wore, I I made a conscious decision to wear my my Samoe, my robes. I see my my Rakasu here, and I did that on purpose because I thought, you know, it will strike up conversations with people. And and it's interesting, it did. And even at this tent that we were resting under, uh, people asked about, you know, what are you wearing? What is that about? And so it gave me an opportunity to to talk about about uh, you know what I do. You know, I'd say, and here's the here's the thing is that I continually get um, people are, surprise me with their how they're going to respond. I never know. Some people are really happy to meet a Buddhist priest, and other people. What I noticed on the ride, there was a, a a few few people that I talked to were really happy to meet me, and others were silent. And the silence um, indicated to me they didn't know what to say. Right? They probably didn't. You know, this, this is my guess, but they probably didn't know where to place me. Partly because I was inviting for them a different view, a different way of being that they weren't aware of, and they may not have known how to express that linguistically. Right, so there's this silence. And that silence can be very, very uncomfortable for people because what does the mind want to do? The mind wants to know. This is our addiction of the present age. We've got to know. And uh, so, so uh, this was, this was an interesting experience. It's, it's an opportunity again for me to be reminded of the importance of expressing our own views because it reminds other people, even if you know, we know that our views are limited, but other people's views, sometimes other people don't realize their views are limited. And you don't have to go up to their face and say, hey, you got a small view. You get, but but it, when we present our views, when we present our views, whether it's simply showing up in Buddhist garb or however you might do that, maybe it's uh, something that you feel important about. It doesn't have to be Buddhism, but you share your perspective. And sometimes you get uh, uh, a round of applause. Sometimes you get silence. Be pulled or swayed one way or the other by that. And then, um, here, oh, I can't see this uh, this so much, but behind me is the um, state capital of Des Moines. And uh, let me see if I can. Oh, the, the image didn't come out so good. Anyways, uh, so that was that was my experience on the ride, and and. I thought maybe it might be interesting to hear from from you guys this limited time we have now and I know we're at time so if you have to go feel free to but uh, it might be a conversation starter think about what are ways that you may experience your own small views or experience how your view illuminates the small views of others Right. Something to maybe have a conversation now. So I want to invite that. I want to invite that now. Maybe take some time to think about how how you recognize your when your views are small, and how you illuminate. You might illuminate through your own presence the small views of others. Thank you.
questions. Oh uh, yeah, I see Eric's got his hand up. Go ahead. Sorry, I just uh, muted. Thank you, Station, for a uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I'll be reflecting on it a lot. Um, I started using Facebook after not using it for years, except to maybe check in once every four months or so. And uh, some of the friends I kept in contact with, um, I played sport games with, um, and they very uh, uh, Christians of um, with, uh, a kind of non denominational uh, Christianity. And uh, I met other met friends um, in my neighborhood um, that of Christian faith. And I grew up as a Christian in, in Iowa. And uh, in my post, I, I sometimes um, I thought, should I uh, exclude them from the audience? Because there's not now an, an option I saw. Like, would this confuse them? If I post Dogen, a, uh, a Dogen calligraphy uh, where I was uh, living at uh, Austin Zen Center huh. as my banner, and then I posted Mother Mary <laughs> on a painting of, of Mother Mary uh, in uh, Italy uh, as a banner. And would that keep confusing them? Because they know that I lived at Zen Center and I'm posting reflections on Christianity as well. Mm. And, uh, I don't know. Some sometimes I, I, I did recently because I, I just started using it, and I used this option, and I thought hmm, maybe that would confuse them too much, and then I omitted this. And so I think we're always um, exactly like you're saying with, with your teacher. We're always sending a message, just either it's I guess making karma. Uh, Maybe even if we're not speaking and our tongue is pressed up behind our teeth, and but the way we're moving is making karma, or our mind is making karma. I guess that is the teaching: is that our mind is making karma even if we're not speaking. Uh, but it's just more subtle. Um, and so, posting something on an image that's going to go out to anyone on your feed is making karma. And so I'm just reflecting on what I'm putting out uh, moment by moment. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Hi, Darshim, it's Vicki. I'm over here in the corner. Um, so, yeah, it's almost like we think that these qualities are fixed and permanent about us, like I'm nice. I can be a very passionate person, but I'm not being very passionate right this second. So it's easy to, to latch onto these and think that they're fixed and permanent. And then I think we translate that to other things like you're wrong, as if that's fixed and permanent. And I noticed I've done that in my life. Um, there was a person I used to work with that I thought was an idiot. And of course, I just... You know, I, I actually, when he had good ideas, I couldn't hear what he said because I just had him, him fixed and permanent. You're an idiot. You don't understand this. And it, finally, someone else so that I respected would say, well, Vicki, um, that's a really good idea. What about blah, blah, blah? And all of a sudden, it was like, oh. But, you know, it really blinds us when we really have these qualities as fixed and permanent that you're nice, that you don't understand stuff, that, you know, you're stupid or and all of this stuff. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. This is Pam. Uh, I think this is something I've made part of my practice. Just one of the, you know, two or three things that I try to keep in my head is just, uh, you know, after, I don't know, somebody raised it in a Dharma talk or I read something or something about view, you know, when 
when this is a view, I, sometimes I just remind myself, it's, and I notice it more often because I'm carrying it around in my head. It's like, oh, view. It's basically noting when an opinion becomes really strong in me, you know, when it really comes up and, you know, feels like part of my body or part of my identity. Um, and I think just trying to notice that has has really been helpful to me. Nice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also it's helpful in being able to take in other people's views mm -hmm. as well, because you don't have that wall up. Yeah, so it sounds like your strategy is to remind yourself that this is a view. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, yeah, I would encourage you to keep keep doing that. I think we all would benefit. Not from you doing it, but from... <laughs> <laughs> so you can stop it. <laughs> I'll benefit from you doing it for sure. But, but uh, we all got to do it. That's that's all of our practice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Myori. Hi there. Thank you for your talk, Daishin. Um, kind of a riff on what Shoji was just saying. I was just uh, reflecting on how this, I noticed this a lot with friends of mine, like we get into conversations and they can get, you know, and I have lots of opinions and they get opinionated and you can feed off that with each other. You know, it's like, oh yeah, it is like this mm -hmm. um, and sort of calcify that idea. But I notice with my practice, one thing that happens without me trying sometimes is sort of like the don't know mind steps forward. And it's almost like if I hear something that someone says, it's like it is just like this one thing. All of a sudden it's like, is it? And then I just stay there in like a pause and it kind of deflates the energy that's building around that idea, if that makes sense. Oh. So, so, so you get all of these different, different uh, perspectives swimming around, and then if I understood you correctly, somebody makes an analogy between those perspective and something else, and it helps to deflate things. Um, can you say more? I would just say it's more like if I hear someone make a definitive statement or tell a story about something, it's almost like, sorry about that. <laughs> It's almost like my response is a question, as if it's like, well, I don't know if that's true. Oh, and I see. Sort I of see. takes away like the energy of that being. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that that's a a, a way of of um, it's kind of like um, uh, how do I say it? Like insul insulating yourself from a poison. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I see like, like asking the question, am I sure? Am I sure this is real? Or am I sure that's the only view? It's kind of a way, an, a way to, uh, it's like a, a, a like an immune, immune booster shot, mm. to prevent the view from like going down the road of disagreement or maybe your view changes into their view, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not, it's a more doing. spacious feeling. It's like that I think sort of affects the situation just like, yeah, that question deflates the the poison or like. Beautiful. Yeah. The question itself it just creates a space around it so that it doesn't get too narrow. Right. Beautiful. Just a note on that, I, if I understand it correctly, that I think this is also a way to interrupt the, the piling on mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, the piling on when people start expressing similar views, mm -hmm. they can ratchet each other up. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that pause can also kind of interrupt that rolling, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's nice to be with all like-minded people, but that can also get us into a really narrow, narrow space as well. Oh yeah, another uh, another place. So it's it, this could be helpful for when we're with people who think differently. It could also be helpful for when when we're with people who think similarly. Benji, hi Daishin. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello everybody. Uh, I thought that was brilliant what you said about people identifying with a feeling that 
they were told as a young child, like, you're nuts or whatever, you're told some, somebody might be told something. And, and then also telling somebody that there was, there was a study done that if you tell somebody that their work is getting better, that that likely may be more helpful than just telling them they're good at their work. Mm -hmm. So as a way to encourage them so they don't identify with being good at something. And I think that is absolutely brilliant. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> totally use that and, and, and use it on myself as well, hopefully. Yeah, great. I, I think that's where it's got to start is with our, just the self-talk, the talk that we, that we have with ourselves. You know, to recognize those places where we we do get caught in identities, and uh, and begin to question them, and you could start to say, you know, when you when you do a self evaluation, to think of it not in terms of good and bad, but in terms of, um, uh, yeah, this can get better. I can do better. Yeah. Thanks for that, Benji. Thanks for your practice. I had mentioned this to Vicki as well as to Daishin. Um, I, I was reading Living Buddha, Living, uh, Living Christ at a health uh, clinic. And one of the friends who happens to be E Free Church wanted to read it also because her son is uh, married to someone who's a Buddhist and she was curious about it. And so I was, I was frightened. I could feel myself talking about this being frightened. Um, and um, I thought, oh, okay, she's asking me. I didn't, I didn't uh, project or uh, proselytize anything since I was just reading it. So I had given it to her, and it, it, I don't know where it went. All of a sudden, it came around. It finally came back to me to another friend who's also of the Efri Church, and I said, oh. You know, I, I wasn't sure what happened. There was nobody talked to me about this view or or anything. And I was kind of discouraged because who brought it back was actually the the wife of, of the E Free Church minister. And I was kind of excited. And I wanted, I guess I, I what I felt was I would like to sit down and have some discussion about these views or about what was said in here or about anything, or even if they felt it was wrong view or just something. And I, I, I feel this huge emptiness, this huge non wanting to communicate. And um, I come to a point where uh, it was very frightening for me to read this book in, um, in public. Uh, and I, that's just my own issue that I've, I've carried with me. Um, but I just feel sad about that, you know, the inability of us just to sit down and, you know, just yeah. listen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, I, it sounds very, very painful. I, I'm imagining you just received this book back with absolutely no, no, uh, no feedback about it. Yeah, it so was just laying there. Yeah, it was laying right. there at the table. And but I was Oh, I see. And I, yeah. went, I was laying on a table with my friend and we were playing games, but she didn't even, she didn't say the words. I'm starting to cry because it's just really sad. She didn't say the name. Right. And I said, oh, who brought this back? Because I thought it was this other friend, Jill. Nothing, nothing was said. And that, you know, there's a non-communication between people. Whether you believe or not, it's that's not the point. It's about human connection, right? And about just communicating whatever whatever you believe and and listening. So that was a great sadness. Yeah, it it can be very it can be very isolating. I I think also no doubt. I and I and I want to affirm that experience of sometimes it's a kind of profound isolation when we don't get the feedback or even negative feedback. Um, and at the same time, uh, these folks that had maybe looked at the book, maybe a few pages or whatnot, they're getting introduced to another perspective and they all, they have, that's their, that's where they are. So it's opening up the, the diversity that's present in, in Boone, just by you being there, you're creating diversity. And that's a positive thing, even if it's not understood. 
And who knows where that might lead to in the, in the future. We'd like to think it would maybe people, you know, Buddhism isn't gonna stop uh, somehow coming through. It might transform in different phases, but these ideas are gonna continue. They've been continuing and they're getting closer to us in, in many ways in our particular society. Um, but it also points to the need for us to congregate amongst ourselves uh, as well, because we need that. We need the nourishment of the Sangha, people with similar views. It's, it's important to have the, the, the communal community connection and be with like-minded people that um, uh, can say, I, you know, I take refuge in the Buddha. Not that everybody here has to say that or commit to it, but at least I take refuge in Zazen, right? Or I, I want to know more about the Dharma. And I appreciate the support of a community that wants to keep me held accountable for my actions and, and wants me to do better and be, be, be the, be, the best me that I can be. We need that community of support for sure. And so I just, I would encourage each of us to, to nourish the song. And that's why we have the Nebraska Zen Center too, is that people can come together in a group and, and uh, we support each other and we know we're not crazy, right? That's the thing. We know we're not crazy. We got other, or we know we're with a bunch of other crazy people. So we're <laughs> good company. <laughs> yeah, got good company. But I, that was one of my big insights when I was working in the mental health as a chaplain uh, in behavioral health several months into it, I thought I was going crazy. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm not crazy. <laughs> and that's the support. That's the power of people working. That comes not from insight. It comes from people working together and recognizing, no, this isn't crazy. This isn't strange. This, is, this practice has been going on for 2,500 years formally. But it's been going on much longer than that since humanity has started. You think the Buddha was the only the, was the first Buddha? No way. There must have been other people who knew the insights of the Buddha prior to him, and they and they had the support of other teachers. So this practice that we're doing is not new. It's not uh, it's not something new. It's not something special. Uh, anybody who's Christian could benefit from doing this practice. My teacher would say, if you're a Christian and you practice Zazen, you can become a better Christian. Mm -hmm. It's not about converting anybody to Buddhism. We don't have to do that. I do this because I absolutely love it. And it, it, uh, it, it keeps my mind uh, uh, relatively equanimous, or at least it gives me a container for those ups and downs uh, that do appear. And, uh, so yeah, this practice, this practice is not a aberration. It's not a sin. It's a, it's a practice of love. It's a practice of compassion. It's a practice of wisdom uh, so that we can deepen our views of the world, that we can see wider, we can see the depth. We can, we can see ourselves as a part of this amazing life journey that we're just a little bubble that will, you know, we're just like a little bubble floating on top of the water and it pops. Our life is over in a flash, in an instant. And then we join that big ocean. We become the ocean again. That's our, and we want to see that. We don't want to wait till we die. <laughs> Let's see that now. <laughs> we have to develop patience for that. Right? We just see it immediately. I think I, Thinking back of what you said, I think their silence was probably similar to the silence that some that you experienced in Ragbri with some people. Absolutely. Not knowing. Just yeah. Yeah, not knowing. Yeah. And that's okay. It's okay to give people the permission to do that. Yeah, Jacqueline. <clears throat> Hi, this is my first time being here. Um, I was I want oh. you to please repeat the part about the ocean thing and the bubbles because I thought that was really profound I was I was actually thinking about that I was thinking about like how the nature of like kind of the self is and how there isn't one from what I understand in Buddhism right right yeah yeah that's a so that's a that's a typical metaphor within uh, Buddhism uh, that that we are like bubbles that the individual is like a bubble on the surface of water 
and or froth we're like froth in the ocean and you you know if you've ever been to the ocean you watch the wave roll in and there's all that froth there and then you see the bubbles just dissipate and it becomes water again and and this is a metaphor for the the big self there's the small self and then there's the big self the small self is this thing that we identify with as our self the big self is the is the the whole universe and we are simultaneously both of these selves but as we've been growing up and educated we tend to identify with the bubble and we we unless we have some either a, a disciplined spiritual practice or some kind of um spontaneous experience uh, then that uh we confuse our identity with the bubble and we we don't see our I, ourselves as the whole universe but this is this is just basic buddhist practice it's not something special but it's something that we need to put effort into to seeing regularly that's that's the purpose of zazen is that we see that oh i'm not just this little self i'm also you know if it wasn't for the sun out there i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the earth this is this is part of my body our body is the body of the whole cosmos uh daishin this is uh, pam i hate to interrupt this exceedingly interesting conversation but we're running up against uh, absolutely yeah thank you all for your your sharing and uh for the overtime here we are we're at time